and good afternoon, KPA listeners. This is Captain Wells. This is the Captain Wells Show. Uh, I've been on hiatus for about two weeks because of the holidays, so this is my first show in the new year. And I'm excited to be back. It's a wonderful day. It's a warm day. Uh, you know, during the holidays, it was kind of cool. So now we're back to, look how this weather is changing so quickly. Now we're back to sort of like warm weather. We had cool weather, and in fact, we even had rain. Well, today I'm excited because I have, this is a political talk show, but today we're going to talk about something light, you know, and I like that. I think it's a good idea for me to periodically discuss subjects that aren't so controversial, because I'm always talking about controversial stuff. But I don't think food can be considered controversial unless, no, never. I consider myself a foodie. Uh, maybe I'm not, but I like to think that I am. I'm a foodie in the sense that I watch Food Network. You know, I love to watch that show. I love to cook. So I'm, I have today restaurateur Brad Johnson. He's a second-generation restaurateur. He's the owner of the restaurant Post and Bean, which is located in the neck of the woods where I grew up, which is uh, the Baldwin Hills Clash Crenshaw Shopping Center. I'm not, I haven't been to the restaurant, but I'm, I'm going to make a special effort to go now that I'm having the owner on the show and that I've read about it. It sounds fabulous. He's also the owner of the restaurant in Venice, which is called Willie Jane, which is an unusual name. I'm going to have to ask him, how did he come up with that name, Willie Jane? It's on Abbott Kinney Boulevard in Venice. But before I bring on that, Brad, I would be, you know, given that this is a political show, I would be remiss if I didn't mention, if I didn't mention the killings that took place uh, the massacre. Do I want to call it the massacre? You know, I, I'm, I'm, I try to be, you know, careful with the words I use. I try to be careful because words are important. But the killings that took place in Paris at the satirical magazine Charlie Hebdo, and um, this magazine has been uh, known, famous for, or rather infamous for doing mocking uh, politicians and mocking religious leaders such as the Prophet Muhammad, and uh, there have been a lot of protests. In fact, they had the magazine, It's a, as I said, a satirical magazine. Uh, they draw satirical cartoons. In 2011, the publication was firebombed uh, because they mocked the Prophet Muhammad. Again, in 2012, there was a protest for mocking the Prophet Muhammad. I haven't analyzed it. Sufficiently, I don't have enough information, but um, I want to raise some issues. I want to raise some questions about this issue of free speech. They defend the uh, journalist or the editor of the magazine, Charlie Hebdo, defended mocking politicians and religions, re religious leaders. He defended it on the basis of freedom of speech. So my question to KCA listeners is, do we have freedom of speech in America? Do you really think that we have freedom of speech here? Can we just, I mean, fully, you know, I, you know, in law you cannot do hate speech. So, you know, freedom of speech, there's a limit to it. You can't do hate speech. So the question is, mocking a religious leader, is that considered hate speech? Would you consider that hate speech so that it could be curtailed? It could not be done. You know, I don't know. Do we have freedom of speech? Well, you know, if you talk about the Holocaust, you know people have been arrested in Europe for talking about the Holocaust. They've been arrested. There's t some people are still in prison. So you can't, in Europe, you can't, you can't talk about the Holocaust. I guess they call them Holocaust deniers, but some, some think they're holo Holocaust revisionists. I want to be able to talk about these issues. In fact, I was recently uh, banned on Facebook for criticizing Israel. I have a temporary ban on Facebook for criticizing Israel. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I don't have all the answers. I don't know. I haven't fully analyzed it, but I want to just raise those issues before we bring on my guest. So that's the issue. Do we really have freedom of press? Mocking a religious leader, is that considered hate speech? Those are the issues that I'm putting on the table. Now let me bring on my guest, Brad Johnson. As I said, he's a second-generation Restaurant tour. His restaurant in Los Angeles is Post and Beam, which is located in the Baldwin Hills area. Uh, it sounds fabulous. I did a lot of reading about it, and and I'm excited to to welcome Brad to the Kathleen Wells Show. Hi, Brad. Hey, Kathleen. 
So how are, how are you doing? Tell me, how did you get into the restaurant business to begin with? I know you're second generation. Was it your dad I, that influenced you? Yeah, my dad owned a restaurant on the Upper West Side of Manhattan called The Cellar uh, for about 25 years, and uh, I started uh, my career there as a dishwasher, and uh, that's uh, how I initially got introduced to the business. And so you've had restaurants on both coasts, East Coast mm -hmm. and West Coast. Tell me about your restaurant that you had on the East Coast. Uh, well, after um, being in business with my dad, in the early 80s, I opened a restaurant on Columbus Avenue called Memphis, which was a uh, Cajun-style, New Orleans-style restaurant on Columbus Avenue, and then went on to open several other restaurants. At one point, I partnered with Dick Ashford and Valerie Simpson and uh, did a place with them called 2020 uh, and had just a, a great run in New York and, uh, and enjoyed my, my time there in my hometown in, in the restaurant business. So do you find people who dine on the East Coast to be different from people who dine here on the West Coast? Is there a difference? I wouldn't say there's necessarily a difference. I mean, a lot of our clientele travel between both coasts. You know, we definitely have uh, members of the entertainment community and business community that, uh, you know, do New York, L.A. Uh, pretty often. So I wouldn't necessarily say there's a difference. I know when I first opened... Uh, the first place that I opened in L.A. was a nightclub on Sunset Strip called Roxbury. And it was a three-level venue, and we had a restaurant on the middle floor. And I wanted to put, and did, put fried chicken and mashed potatoes on the menu. And I remember the reaction uh, at, at the time when I suggested it. And, and people were like, oh, people don't eat like that out here. And, you know, lo and behold, it became the, the best-selling thing on our menu. So I, I, I think that the... Uh, you know, the, the image that uh, Californians have or Angelinos have as being more health conscious uh, when it comes to food than people from anywhere else, I think is not necessarily true when it comes to dining out. Yeah, I mean, because fried, who's not going to like fried chicken and mashed potatoes? However, you make it at your restaurant, Post and Bean, that kind of fare, southern fare, but you kind of, you don't make it as heavy. Is that right? Well, I mean, you fried chicken, and that's, you know, it's hard to get around that when you're trying to, you know, have some degree of authenticity. We do use canola oil. Um, we do. We are careful with our seasoning. I mean, you don't want to, uh, you don't want to overdo the salt, and we try to be careful about that. We don't put salt and pepper on the table. We do make it available, uh, but we try to balance the menu rather than giving people an, an inauthentic version of fried chicken. We give them real fried chicken, but then we also give them ample choices of great salads with fresh produce, locally grown, that kind of thing, just to, to balance out and to give some options. Well, okay, let's step, you know, I sort of got ahead of myself. Let's step back a little and tell the story about, you know, what I think is that it's in business it's your connections are important, your relationships are important, and that's how you're successful as a business person. I mean, that's the sense that I get. And so why don't you go back a bit and tell us how your father started his business, and also tell us uh, your story about meeting Miles Davis. Sure. Um, well, you know, it's a, it's a great, um, I think my dad's story is a, is a really good story for, um, you know, any aspiring entrepreneur that doesn't even necessarily have the background uh, or the financial backing necessarily to, uh, to get into business. My dad found that he enjoyed going out. He was a very charismatic guy. He wasn't particularly into food, though he liked to eat. He wasn't particularly into food, though he, you know, had a, a taste for some drinks. But he found himself going out quite a bit back in the late 60s, early 70s in New York, and just thought that he would be effective uh, as, a, uh, as an owner rather than as a patron. And as things would have it, the, uh, the seller at the time had been opened by another African-American businessman who felt that clientele had become too black for him. And so my father stepped right into that void, bought the seller from him, and uh, and was off to the races and really kind of built his business on his the force of his personality, his ease with conversation. My dad was a, was a smart, well-read guy, could talk to anybody about any subject, and I think that uh, it was really the force of his personality that propelled him uh, to success in, in his business. 
Well, you have to have a good personality to be good in business. And as I said, you know, connections are everything. It sounds like you have a wonderful personality. I read a lot. You know, there's a piece in you about your restaurant, Post and Beam, in Vanity Fair. There's one in Essence, in uh, Los Angeles Times, uh, on and on and on. And, in fact, you've had various uh, businesses, restaurants, before you opened Post and Beam. You mentioned uh, the one that was called Roxbury. Is that correct, Roxbury? Yes. Was that on Sunset? It was, yeah. Well, you know, I remember, I grew up in Los Angeles. I'm a native Los mm-hmm. Angelino. And there used to be the Roxbury. It's not the same thing, is it? Well, there was no the. It was Roxbury. And uh, it, it uh, became A Night at the Roxbury, the movie that uh, the Saturday Night Live guys produced. But, yeah, that was uh, that was our nightclub. Oh, the, the Roxbury? I don't know if yeah. I'm not, The Roxbury? Because I remember I went there years ago uh, mm-hmm. to see B.B. King. Is it the same one? I'm no, you might be thinking of the Roxy. Oh, the Roxy. Okay, you're right. Yeah. My mistake. You're right. You had <laughs> because I said it's, the Roxy is the club, but the Roxbury. Now, how? What? Where was it located on Sunset? Roxbury was uh, right next to the Chateau Marmont and uh, right underneath the uh, infamous Marlboro Man billboard. Oh, and that is close to the Roxy. So, I mean, yeah. gosh, was there confusion sometime when people would go to the Roxy and as opposed to the Roxbury? Did they confuse that like I just did? <laughs> I, I, I'm sure that there were some that did. Okay. So they, two cocktails, it's easy enough to, to confuse the two. Yeah, because they're close. So, and then you also had Memphis and BLT Steak and Georgia. So you've had a lot of right. restaurants. Yes. And then finally you came to... Uh, not finally, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm, when I say finally, it's not like you're going to stop with Post and Beam. In fact, you didn't stop. You, mm-hmm. subsequent to Post and Beam, you've opened Willie Jean. How did you come up with that name, Willie Jean? Willie Jane uh, is the uh, name of my dad's only remaining sibling. She turned 101 uh, this past year, and I was just always fascinated by her name. I thought that the for a woman, the name uh, to have a name start with Willie was was pretty interesting, and I just thought that someday I might use that uh, as a restaurant name. And the opportunity ar- arise came came about in Venice, and uh, that's that's the the name that we selected. Willie Jane. Well, we're going to take a break, but when we come back from the break, I'd like you to talk to me about how you met Miles Davis. Tell us that story. That's a fascinating story. So we're going to talk about that when we come back from the break, and then we're going to also talk about what you serve at Willie Jane, which is in Venice. I'm speaking with Brad Johnson, who is a restaurateur. His restaurants are Post and Bean, which is in the Baldwin Hills slash Crenshaw Shopping Center. He also has the restaurant Willie Jane on Abbott Kinney in Venice Boulevard. We're going to, we're going to continue with him and he's going to tell us a very funny story about how he met Miles Davis. So we'll be right back. This is the Kathleen Wells Show. We'll be right back. Ah, welcome back, welcome back, welcome back to the Kathleen Wells Show. I'm your host, Kathleen. This is AM 1050 KCAA. And my guest today is restaurateur, second generation, Restaurateur. Uh, his father's name was Howard Johnson, but he wasn't the Howard Johnson that we all know. He's a different Howard Johnson, but just as just as well known, I should say. <laughs> um, second generation restaurateur Brad Johnson is my guest today. He is the owner of the restaurant Post and Bean, which is in the Baldwin Hills Crenshaw slash Crenshaw Shopping Center. In fact, that's my old stomping ground where I grew up. I remember there used to be a Kentucky, not Kentucky, Goldenberg chicken there. It's no longer there. He's the, re- he's the owner of that restaurant and also Willie Jane, which is in Venice, California. So, Brad, tell us the story about how you met Miles Davis at your dad's restaurant in New York. Sure. Sure. Before I do, though, I'll, I'll go back to something you just said. So the, uh, the Goldenberg location that you just referred to is now Post and Bean, so... We actually took over that building, demolished it, and uh, that's uh, that's where Post and Beam stands. So at least you'll you'll know exactly where we are since it's your old neighborhood. Exactly. That yeah. I mean, everyone knew the everyone knew where Goldenberg was near the Crenshaw Shopping Center. So if you want to go to Post and Beam and t- 
taste delicious food with a southern flair, go to the old Golden Bird because it's no longer. <laughs> it's now Post and Beam, owned by Brad Johnson. Did I say it yeah. right? Yes, you did. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the Miles Day, you know, one of the one of the great things, Kathleen, about being in the restaurant business is the cross section of people that uh, that you get to meet, and I've been really fortunate in that way. Um, so, back in the, uh, my dad was a huge Miles Davis fan. In fact, in the uh, the book that Quincy Troop wrote about Miles, Miles uh, refers to my dad in the cellar as having the bre- the best fried chicken in the world. So, my dad was a big fan of Miles, and Miles was a fan of my dad and, and his restaurant. So, late, late one Thursday night, um, you know, we used to have bands, and they would play until four o'clock in the morning because the bars in New York stay open that late, unlike Los Angeles. And so late one Thursday night, Miles comes strolling in and Miles, Miles was a notorious night owl and was known to indulge in, you know, various things. So on this particular night, he seemed uh, more than a little bit tipsy and handed me a, a coat to, to help him with off the shoulders. And as I did that, um, I, I took his coat and put his coat away for him and Several hours later, when Miles was ready to go, I went to get his coat and noticed a, a burn hole in his sleeve and didn't remember seeing that when I removed the coat, the coat the first time and, you know, was like, oh my goodness, I don't know how this happened, but I certainly don't want Miles to blame me. So when I went back upstairs and handed him his coat, I kind of folded it over, handed it to him and he was out the door and that was that and I thought I had escaped. So. Several years go by, and I'm at a party that uh, Valerie Simpson is giving for her husband, Nick, a birthday party. And uh, she, Whitney Houston, and Roberta Flack are singing Happy Birthday to Nick. And the doorbell rings, and the only person available to answer the door is me. So I walk over to the door, open it up, and lo and behold, it's Miles Davis. And I'm like, hey, Miles, how you doing? Brad Johnson, Howard Johnson's son, you remember me? And he says, yeah, you the mf that burned my coat so he remembered me years later so what had happened was he had a cigarette in his hand and i didn't realize that so as i removed his coat he forgot that he was smoking his cigarette got dislodged in the arm of his burberry coat and burned a hole in his sleeve that he never forgave me for so there and, you have it and isn't that amazing that he would remember that years <laughs> later yeah. <laughs> I think that's a funny story, but it also speaks to me about the fact how important it is to have connections. And what I was talking entrepreneurship, businessship. How do people get into? How do people start a business? And I think you know, not only you having your dad's connection and the experience, the training, but also you had built relationships that helped you to start your businesses. Can you talk about how that was a, an essential part of building a business? Sure. sure. I think, you know, in, in any industry, but in mine in particular, you know, your reputation is really all that you have. And I think, you know, you, you have to be known as a hard worker. You have to be known as honest. Um, you know, success always has a degree of luck mixed into it. But, you know, one of the, one of the biggest challenges that we have, especially as African Americans, you know, is, funding and where to find the money when we're trying to launch our businesses. And, you know, my generation came about at a time when, you know, all, all of us started going, venturing into other neighborhoods. And, you know, my dad's generation, the generation before is, you know, we weren't necessarily integrated into the, uh, the, the, the white owned nightclubs and bars. So we kind of created our own and our neighborhoods were, were vibrant full of those kinds of places. I know in the time when my dad had the cellar, there were four or five other black-owned restaurants and bars in that neighborhood that were patronized almost primarily by black folks. And they, they survived. They were successful. But, you know, these days you find a lot less of that because the, the, the newer money, the, the athletes, entertainers, the, the young money now is, you know, they're going out all over the place. They're at Soho House and they should be in, you know, I think uh, uh, the the you know one of the um, unfortunate outcomes of integration has been the um, you know the demise of black-owned businesses, and I think that makes it very difficult um, for the black entrepreneur or restaurateur to find the much-needed funds. But to come back to your question, uh, it, it, you know, Post and Beam came about 
as a result of my relationship with a very successful, very very well-known African-American businessman by the name of Ken Lombard. Ken used to be the president of Magic Johnson Development Company. He's now a partner with Capri Capital that's owned by Quentin Primo out of Chicago. And when they were looking to um, give the mall, the Baldwin Hills Mall, a new identity, Ken approached me having already done a successful, uh, we had a successful uh, business together prior to this. And Ken came back to me and said, hey, you know, we'd really like a signature restaurant um, to kick things off for us at the mall. Would this be something that you'd be interested in? And Ken was able to provide the funding, a very favorable lease and basically create an environment for, for us to open a restaurant. I know Alexander Smalls in New York, you know, has a similar relationship with Dick Parsons, and it takes those kinds of relationships with people that have means to take a chance on the, the African-American entrepreneur or restaurateur in, in our case. And, uh, it you know, it requires the, the relationship and the trust that uh, hopefully come as a result of, of sex successful endeavors, but uh, we definitely uh, we need more of that around. We need to see more of that, the new money from athletes and entertainers coming back into the community and looking to support these kinds of businesses. Otherwise, they're going to go away, and we're, you know, we won't have them anymore. Yeah, this is, you're an example of, about what I talk about in theory all the time. In fact, I have a lot of uh, People on my show like Taki S. Raton was just on three weeks ago talking about exactly what we're, you were talking about, this disparity, this gap between groups, between whites and blacks and other groups. And b- bl- blacks are basically scraping the bottom of the barrel in terms of their, their wealth and well-being. On all indices, you see they're scraping. So it's important that you start businesses, and you're how you spoke about the fact that this is so, I mean, you're an example of what I talk about, the theory, you know. How before, yeah. when we had segregation, you had many restaurants owned by blacks in, in our community, in our neighborhood. But that's no longer happening. So what, you know, because we cannot, because we're integrated now and we don't have access to capital. But you're the exception, and how can people duplicate what you've done? How can young black men duplicate and go out and find people to partner with? Well, Kathleen, I think I think your voice is important. I think giving people like myself an opportunity to come on the radio, to come on television, to get uh, quoted in articles, encouraging investment this way. I mean, there are, there have been articles written recently about you know can black businesses survive gentrification, and so now where you see the resurgence of areas like Baldwin Hills and Harlem and Oakland, and where you know that have traditionally been African-American enclaves, now you see new businesses and new opportunities coming in, but those new businesses and opportunities aren't always for the people who have, who have kind of lived through the rough times. And we really have to encourage the people who have means, and I, I hate to single out the athletes and the entertainers, but I'm in Los Angeles and we're surrounded by them. And I can tell you, I don't see enough of them coming back to our neighborhoods and supporting these businesses. And that's what has to happen. The people who have the means have to find the people who have the experience and support them. It's just that simple. Otherwise, you know, these businesses just won't exist. A piece of our history will be gone, and, you know, we'll be relying on others to, you know, tell to tell us where we should be going to spend our money, or we won't have the businesses around to support when we, when we decide that that's, you know, that we miss them and we wish that we had them. Uh-huh. And in fact, I saw some data that indicated that the unemployment rate for blacks is never below 20%, never below it. So one way in which we can get that unemployment rate down is never below 20%. Did I say that right? And so one way in, uh, to get that unemployment rate down is for people to start to own their own businesses. Right? And employ black people. In fact, you know, I have Dr. Claude Anderson on my program, and he says, we don't even have black communities anymore. You know, I mean, Baldwin Hills are sort of like, is a black community, but they're very few and far between, right? Well, you know, I want to go back to something that you said. When we, when we went to Open Post and Beam, which, as you know, having grown up in that area, that, you know, it's predominantly African American in the neighborhood. When we advertised that we were opening a restaurant and we were hiring, this was in 2012 when, you know, the economy was still very bad and unemployment was, you know, higher than it even is now. And, of course, in that community.
community higher than the national average. We advertise at Craigslist where all restaurants, everybody in the hospitality business advertises that, you know, we have positions, we're hiring all positions, and ran ads for, you know, consecutive weeks. Of the 40 or 50 or so people that we had respond to our ads, I had four African-American applicants in that neighborhood. And that told me a couple of things. One, if you're unemployed and you don't know where to look for work, that's a problem. So if you're not looking on Craigslist, then, you know, where are you looking? <laughs> you know, Because mm-hmm. this is where people are advertising that are hiring. And, you know, it also told me, which is something that I've experienced before, is that black folks look at the restaurant industry and the service industry through some kind of a jaded, mm-hmm. you know, viewpoint. And it's I don't know if it's the, the, the negative connotation of the service part of it or what is whatever it might be, but they don't recognize that there's a stepping stone and that there's a career to be had. And, you know, you may start out as a buster or you may start out as a host. You may start out as a dishwasher, but you may ultimately end up as a manager or a chef or an owner. There's a there's a process that you have to go through. And, and I think a lot of times, you know, we just would rather not even go for the job rather than take the job that we think may be below us and instead take no job. So, as a result, when we opened Post and Beam, you know, I hired a multi-ethnic staff and got some criticism from the neighborhood for not having enough African Americans employed. But mm-hmm. of course, anybody that would listen, I, I told them the story of the challenges that we had when it came to hiring. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, that's a very depressing story. But <laughs> that you would that only four blacks applied uh, that is so depressing to me. We need to get re-educated or educated. It's very depressing. When we come back from the break, we're going to talk about your partner, who is a master chef. In fact, he started his career at Spago. He's a protege. In fact, I saw him on, um, let's see, on what is my Food Network. I watch Food Network all the time because I consider myself a foodie, even though I'm really, I'm not really. But I like to, I like food. I like the idea of food, how to cook it well and all that stuff, and I love eating it. Um, so we're going to talk about your partner, Govan. Am I pronouncing his name? Govan Armstrong. Who used Govind. To work, Govind. Who used to work at Spago. He started there as a dishwasher, no? No. I mean, uh, no, as a, as a cook. He started there as a cook. Okay. We're speaking with Brad Johnson, restaurateur of Post and Bean, where the old uh, Goldenberg Chicken used to be. You know where that is, guys, right? In the Baldwin Hills slash Crenshaw shopping center. Is that called the Magic Johnson shopping center now? No, No, it's the Baldwin Hills uh, Crenshaw Plaza. The Baldwin Hills Crenshaw Plaza. I should know I grew up there, right. The (laughs) The Baldwin Hills Crenshaw Plaza where the old Goldenberg Chicken used to be. There's Post and Beam now owned by Brad Johnson. And he also has Willie Jean in Venice in Venice, California on Abbott Kinney. You gotta check him out. We'll be right back. We're, we're going to continue our conversation with Brad Johnson. I'll be right back. Uh, welcome back. Welcome back. This is Kathleen at the Kathleen Wells Show. And my guest is restaurateur uh, Brad Johnson, who has Post and Beam in the Baldwin Hills slash Crenshaw Shopping Center, where the old Goldenberg used to be. And he also has a restaurant, Willie G- Jane, which is in uh, Venice, California, on Abbott Kinney. So, Brad, talk to me about your partner. He used to be the uh, chef, a protege, they would call him, at Spago. Everyone knows Spago was on Sunset. Govind, Govind Armstrong. Am I pronouncing his name right? Uh, Govind Armstrong, yep. So tell, tell, us, tell us a little bit about him. He's your partner at both restaurants? Sure, yep. When, I, um, when, when Ken Lombard first approached me about opening a restaurant in Baldwin Hills, one of the things that uh, I thought would be, you know, extremely important was making sure that the restaurant would not be ignored by the food press. And, you know, Kathleen, as you alluded to, you know, the, the foodie culture these days is, is pretty significant. And to not be part of that conversation just means that you're leaving a lot of business on the table. So in order to do that, um, I knew that I needed a chef that had some pedigree. And I also wanted an African-American chef, given the fact that, uh, you know, we were going to be in that neighborhood, and I thought this was a great opportunity to team up with somebody um, of that ilk. And uh, Govan and I had met a few years prior to that, and just 
hit it off, and I thought this was the, the right opportunity for us to uh, to join forces. So I approached him, and uh, as it turned out, Govan was actually, he was raised in Costa Rica, but he grew up, he was born in Inglewood. So uh, he was quite familiar with the neighborhood. And, uh, yeah, he has a, a fantastic pedigree. He started uh, in Spago's Kitchen when he was 13. Prior to that, he was cooking dinner parties for his mom's guests at his house and developed a real uh, aptitude in the kitchen and uh, went to Spago and Campanile, worked with Nancy Silverton, uh, Ben Ford, and, and quite a long list of, uh, some of the some of the best names in the food business in, in Los Angeles. See how it's important to make those relationships? And you also had a uh, dinner with Marcus Samuelson, who everyone knows if they watch television. He's on Chopped. He's frequently a a judge on the Food Network on Chopped. Tell us about that relationship you have with Marcus Samuelson. Yeah. Marcus and I met uh, back in the 90s when a very dear friend of mine had a fantastic restaurant in New York in the theater district called Jezebel. And Marcus at the time was a chef at uh, the first restaurant that kind of put him on the map called Aqua Beat. And uh, we just have known each other that long. And when Marcus was opening Red Rooster, he and I were in touch a bit. And uh, then, of course, you know, once he once he got it open and it was a phenomenal success, um, you know, he vowed that he would when he would when he planned to come to L.A that uh, he and I would do something. We spent some time together in Los Angeles prior to Post the Beam opening and drove around at various spots and drove around the Baldwin Hills area. And Marcus said that uh, once we got the restaurant open, he would love to come and do a guest chef uh, night with us. And, uh, of course, he knew Govind, and, you know, we were able to put it together, and it was it was just a fantastic night. We called it Harlem and Baldwin Hills. It sold out in no time at all, and it was just one of those real celebratory nights that just make you kind of feel good about being alive. Well, I'm missing all the fun. (laughs) (laughs) And also Tyrese, the actor Tyrese has been at your restaurant. Tell tell listeners about what that was about, him coming with a group of uh, youth, a youth group. Yep. Well, Tyrese and I uh, have been friends for a while. Tyrese has an interest in opening uh, a restaurant. So I've been kind of doing some work with him over the last couple of years and uh, developing his concept and, and looking at various locations with him. So, um, yeah, the Taste of Soul um, was, was it, this was the Saturday that the Taste of Soul was happening, the Danny Bakewell event. That's a phenomenal event in South L.A. And uh, Tyrese knew that, uh, that he was performing, actually, at Taste of Soul, so... He called us and said, look, I'm coming over for lunch, but I'm going to send out a tweet, and I'm basically buying lunch for uh, putting a $1,000 up towards lunch for the first however many people that show up. And uh, that's exactly what he did. And so people, I, I think we must have said about 75 people or so on Tyrese that day. And uh, then he took great pictures with our staff. And it was just a thrill to have him around. But, you know, there's an example, Kathleen, of what I was saying earlier. You know, when our celebrities and athletes and, and people of means recognize that we exist in the community and come and support and spend their money and spread their love, it matters. And somebody like Tyrese, who has a million Facebook followers and, and more, the reach and, and what they create in the way of buzz and, and the legs that they give a business is, is just phenomenal these days, and it just does not happen often enough. It doesn't happen now often enough. It matters. It matters. The relationships matter, and marketing and public relations matter. You know, I have the same problem. i got to tell you, with my radio show, I reach out to people because I need to find advertisers for my show, and it's very difficult. But, you know, the restaurant business is a very iffy business. It's a precarious business, and you've had Post and Beam now there a little over two years. Talk to us how you have sustained this because a lot of restaurants come and go so quickly. But you've been able to sustain Post and Beam a little over two years. What's the secret to your success? Um, yeah, thank you. We um, we actually just celebrated our third year in business uh, this past New Year's Eve, so we're into our fourth year now. And uh, knock on wood, things are going very well. You know, the the restaurant business is a high risk business. Um, there's so many factors that uh, that you know just contribute to to the failure rate. And the thing 
that I think I learned very, you know, maybe midpoint in my career, but uh, later than I would have liked, is the importance of financial discipline and understanding that part of the business. You know, you can be a great chef, you can be a charismatic front of the house presence, you can know a lot about wine and food and construction, but if you don't know accounting, <laughs> you you don't you don't have money at the end of the month. All the, your your business can look full, your restaurant can look prosperous, but you won't be able to balance your books. And I think that a lot of times the financial discipline part of it is missing for a lot of entrepreneurs that get into this business that just think, hey, I got a lot of friends or, you know, I know a little bit about food and, you know, I, I think I could have a cool place. So um, I, I think that. And then I also think it's, you know, it's it, back to the capital thing. I think having, you know, having the support of Ken Lombard and Quentin Primo and Capri uh, allows us to, to have the, the comfort and the knowledge knowing that we had serious financial backers behind us. And a lot of times, you know, these the, the, the restaurateurs that, that open places from borrowing money from aunts and uncles don't have that uh, that financial backing. And it's a, it's a high wire act without it, to say the least. Yeah, a tightrope, you know, walk, yep. walking on a tightrope. Well, we're going to take one more break, and when we come back from the break, I want you to talk about some of the items on your restaurant at Post and Bean. Some of the, oh, sure. my mouth is going to water when I hear it. <laughs> you know how when you look at, you see things, and it's like, oh, my God, that sounds so good. I want to mm. try it. Well, that's what looking at your menu is like. It's like, oh, my God, I want to try that fried chicken, or I can't remember what. Oh, I saw something like berries and um, a biscuit, like a cobbler. Do you have a cobbler there? Uh, we do when it's in season, yep. Okay, we're going to be back and we're going to talk about the items on Brad Johnson's menu at Post and Bean when we come back from the break. Don't go away. Uh, welcome back to the Captain Well Show. My guest today is Brad Johnson, who is a restaurateur and the owner of Post and Bean, which is located in the Baldwin Hills area. Uh, it's where the Golden Bird used to be. Everyone knows where that Golden Bird was. Well, that's where Post and Bean is now, and it's a really fancy restaurant. And, in fact, they have a garden in the back. Tell us a little bit about the garden. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that was actually <laughs> Golden's idea, and, you know, it was, it was really just, just brilliant. Um, and, you know, for the time, it's not – we still buy our, our produce from vendors and – what have you, but it does supply us with some produce and great herbs, and we use everything from the garden for sure. And it's, it, you know, it's become a fantastic thing uh, for people to talk about a great marketing item. Magazines have written about it, what have you. But yeah, it's, it's herbs and lettuces, tomatoes, peppers. We use it in our cocktails. We use uh, some of the herbs in our seasonings. And it, people love sitting outside on the patio and looking at uh, looking at the garden. It's kind of gives you a nice feeling right in the middle of the city. Right in the middle of the city. And some, what are some of the other items on your menu? Well, one of the one of our signature items, when we um, when we were discussing the concept, uh, you know, we, we knew that we need that needed to have some southern touches on the menu, but I really did not want to do just a straight ahead southern restaurant. I felt like, you know, there were there were enough good choices in the neighborhood uh, uh in that uh, uh, that kind of cuisine, so we wanted to kind of bring a little bit something different. So one of the first things that we did was we went out and bought this fantastic wood burning uh, pizza oven, and so we make our own pizzas, and I think our pizzas are fantastic. And along with that, uh, Govan short rib is is uh, just the most tender piece of meat that you would ever want to have, and it's perfectly prepared and a great uh, great sauce that he serves with it. Our fried chicken is fantastic, as I mentioned. But then we also have these great salads, the asparagus and burrata salad. We do chicken and waffles on Sunday. I think our buttermilk pancakes at brunch are, are just fantastic. Um, I think our menu, you know, kind of covers a lot of ground, but also hits home on some of the things that uh, you might like to find when you come into the neighborhood and look for that uh, that down home comfort food. And and then what do you have at Willie? How is Willie Jane? different what is the theme at that restaurant well willie jane's also southern and we also have a uh a vegetable uh, garden right next to the restaurant there right alongside uh Abbot Kinney. willie jane is maybe a little bit more uh refined in terms of 
we don't serve lunch, it's only a dinner, uh, and then brunch on the weekend. Um, but a, maybe a little bit more refined uh, version of, of what we do at Post and Beam, but uh, not an entirely different approach to the food. Uh, it is still Southern. The menu is, is different in terms of item to item, but uh, I, would, I would only uh, define it as, as maybe slightly more refined. So if you were to give advice to someone who wanted to get into the restaurant business, say a young man who is he is good, he's a good cook, he's a chef, he's worked in restaurants, he's always wanted to own his own restaurant, what would you tell him to do? I would say find yourself someone who's done it before and been in the business for a while, someone with experience, and make sure that, uh, you know, you, you do, do, is do your homework on the, the errors and the mistakes that those of us that have experience have made so that you don't make those same errors. I mean, I, you know, even someone like myself who's been in the business as long as I have will still make mistakes and still miscalculate. But I think that for the, for the young entrepreneur, it would serve any young entrepreneur well to just sit and, and listen and, and draw from the counsel of someone who's done it before and uh, hopefully, to, you know, to keep them from making some of the same mistakes. But at the same time, I think the youthful energy and spirit that uh, young entrepreneurs and young restaurateurs or chefs bring to the business is really what propels the business forward. So while I would certainly, uh, you know, recommend that they consult, I think that, the, uh, the energy and the vitality and the creativity that they bring to the business that's new is something that uh, the business will always thrive on and always require. But, but most young guys can't go out to the bank and get a loan, and so they need to find sort of like an angel who is going to loan them the money. How do they establish that kind of relationship, or how do they find that person who can give them some money to open up a, a restaurant? Well, Kathleen, I think that is a, that's a conversation that just needs to get pushed out there a bit. I think that, you know, in particular for young African American entrepreneurs, we need to get more support from those of us that have means. And, you know, the, the people who have been successful need to get back into the communities and look to support and back, uh, and encourage, uh, business ownership among, uh, young people who have, who are so inclined. And, you know, if there's an intermediary that needs to, uh, needs to be involved in that process, look to the, uh, the African American entrepreneurs who are already in business. And if you're a person of means that's looking to support, uh, startups, then find someone who's already in business and together, you know, support a young entrepreneur and put them in business and set them up. Uh, we just have to do more of that. We're not the, we, we've lost our way with that to some degree. And I think examples like Ken Lombard and Quentin Primo from Capri and Dick Parsons in Harlem in New York, those are examples of guys that are doing that. And uh, I think the, the benefits are, are phenomenal to the community when that happens. Mm-hmm. Well, and, you know, and there are programs like that, like Shark Tank, and then there's another one on CNBC where the guy goes out and invests in companies that are struggling or suffering. You know, I always say no man is an island. You know, we're in this together. Uh, somehow we've gotten away from this communal type idea. We're too individualistic. I think our commu- it's important to build your community where you live. It's a very, that was a depressing story when you told me only four people came out. Like you said, I think they didn't know to go on Craigslist. That's what I'm thinking. What do you think? 